Welcome to my second interview with people who are helping me uh, reflect on 15 years of blogging. Uh, today I have with me Jeff Charlotte. Uh, Jeff and I are going to talk about uh, the Ugandan anti-homosexuality bill. Uh, we'll also talk about some current events. Uh, Jeff Charlotte is the best-selling author of The Family and C Street and the executive producer of a Netflix five-part documentary series uh, titled The Family. Uh, that documentary was based on uh, those two books, The Family and C Street, uh, as well as his experience with uh, the Fellowship Foundation. He is also the author, co-author, and editor of five other books, uh, the most recent of which is This Brilliant Darkness, A Book of Strangers. A portion of that book uh, on Russia's anti-LGBTQ crusade won the National Magazine Award. Charlotte is an editor at large for VQR, a contributing editor for Harper's Magazine, and a contributor to Vanity Fair. The New York Times Magazine as well, GQ, Rolling Stone, and, and others. Uh, he is the Frederick Sessions Beebe Professor in the Art of Writing at Dartmouth College, and I'm glad to have Jeff with me today. Maybe we could um, start with the documentary. I'd, I'd like to, you know, you've talked about it a lot, I'm sure, but, you know, if you could talk a, a little bit about the uh, family documentary on Netflix and describe that and, you know, how that took place, how it was conceptualized and, and the place of Uganda and the anti-homosexuality bill uh, in that uh, process of bringing that together. Yeah. Well, that project began, the, the Netflix documentary, The Family, began in, I believe, 2015 is when Netflix came to me and said, we want to do this. And um, my first response, actually, my, well, my first response was no response. I didn't even return their phone calls. Um, uh, I just felt uh, I, I couldn't imagine how you could put that story on screen. You have, you know, you have an organization that doesn't want to be on screen. That makes it difficult. Right. A lot of it is sort of documentary history. Um, uh, which is hard to translate. And, and I had optioned, uh, various people had optioned rights before, nothing had come of it. And I just thought, you know, it's, 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 it's uh, kind of a waste of time. Um, and really, I don't know if it would have happened, but I was uh, teaching a term abroad in, in, in uh, Dublin that fall. And I saw an American phone number. And of course I missed all my friends at home. And I said, oh, who's this? It's a friend. And, and that's how they got me on the line. Cause I had been, I had been sort of, uh, I don't know when I'll get to that. And, and we had a conversation and, and I was impressed um, by their recognition. It, uh, it was a company called Jigsaw Productions, which mm -hmm. Netflix had contracted with. Um, their recognition of all the challenges in telling that story. Uh, so, but then they proceeded. It was, it was sort of uh, their moment. And I, I don't know if it would have happened. They were sort of slowly proceeding. I don't know if it would have happened if Trump hadn't been elected. Um, which I think for a lot of people uh, brought a sense of urgency to the understanding of um, Christian conservatism, political Christian conservatism in, in the United States. Because, you know, I mean, you and I know this sort of story, Warren, but once again, you know, I mean, it's, it's like clockwork the way so many of our colleagues in, in the press if there's a Democrat in power, they're quite certain that the Christian right is gone forever. And then comes someone like Trump with whatever it is, 80% of the vote, and they're flummoxed. Where did this come from? It, it, you know, there's sort of this failure of imagination to sort of recognize that just because a, a segment of the population doesn't get their candidate, doesn't mean they just say, well, I guess, I guess that's that. Uh, we'll just give up our faith and uh, move along now, right? Um, so there they were. Where did they come from? How did they get there? What does it mean? And they started proceeding on making this documentary. Um, and uh, the one thing I will say, actually, that, uh, and we had discussions about how much of a, a part to give to Uganda. 
Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's two other uh, documentaries uh, about the anti-homosexuality bill and, uh, mm -hmm. in Uganda. Um, and I thought, look, taking nothing away from those films, there's, there's big parts of the story still to be told, but even in a five part series, there's only so much you can do. And I think they really wanted to do something new. So that's actually why they decided, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna go off to Romania where mm -hmm. uh, a fellowship through Congressman Bob Adderholt was supporting mm -hmm. a, you know, a bill that was much less violent than Uganda's, but was evidence of the same kind of sort of export of US culture wars. Um, so that's, that's I, I, it's a little bit of a regret that, that we didn't have more of that story there. Um, uh, but on the other hand, I think um, the Netflix documentary is really valuable and, and bringing attention to that organization and to that mode of working, which it's not the fellowships exclusive, you know? I think for a lot of, a lot of secular folks, liberal peoples, they imagine the Christian right as being yokels, as being domestic only, and don't really have a concept of this as a sophisticated social movement that has an international ambitions, and that oftentimes, as we saw in Uganda, um, the the implications of that can be far far more devastating than they are in the United States. And so, hopefully, that that contributed to that expanded awareness. Mm. I'm sorry, that's a long wordy answer, but um, well, no, that's yeah, that's helpful. And I, I was going back through the blog to see when I first started writing about it. It was uh, my first post on Uganda was March 2nd, 2009. I had become aware of an ex-gay conference in uh, Kampala. And it was uh, Scott Lively, Don Schmierer from Exodus, and Caleb Brundage uh, was uh, Richard Cohen's a client actually who was it was a client of Richard Cohen and he was there to offer the ex-gay perspective Caleb Brundage said he was an ex-gay and they were there to tell the Ugandans uh, what homosexuality was about and it just didn't seem like that was all there was to it it didn't seem like it was a good idea for first of all uh, and it seemed like wait our it's not working out here, so you're going to take it there. And uh, I, I had a bad feeling from the very beginning. And then lo and behold, you know, all of, all of what happened, happened. Uh, what got you in, interested in it? That, that was kind of my point of entry was because I had been writing about reorientation therapy. That was my kind of professional interest. Yeah. And, and I'd followed Exodus and, and become a critic of reparative therapy. So I saw them exporting it to there, to Uganda. So what got you into it? I'm trying to remember the timeline. I, I, I think you, you were alert to it before I was, because uh, I know that initial conference didn't show up on my radar. Right. Um, uh, and uh, I wonder if I learned about it from you. Uh, I'm trying to remember who, who called it to my attention. Um, at the time, uh, in 2008, I had published this book called The Family, um, and, um, and, and then sort of two things happened. There, there was all these sort of sex scandals, uh, really, uh, you remember, related to the group, right? right. Uh, and so that brought a lot of attention to it. And at the same time, once that book started selling, all sorts of people started coming forward and saying, oh, here's another aspect of this group you don't know about. Um, and whereas that book had been mostly historical, I was like, oh, now I could do this book that would look at some of these contemporary moments. And someone came to me. Uh, I think it was a it was a, it was a media organization that said, look, um, uh, there's this thing going on in Uganda, and who was it that had the witness? Said, does it have anything to do with this group that you write about? And I, I said, I, I don't know. I first you know, heard you on NPR. It must have, uh, it must have been an NPR then, right? I, I think it was talking so about it. Yeah, they said, I, but they said, does this have anything to do? And it was so. Then I said, well, let me let me go and look. And you know, 
I can't remember. I, I mean, the interesting thing about Uganda is the branch there is is not secretive at all. You know, it's a badge of honor to be involved in this. Oh, that's right. Thing. So uh, it was really quickly easy to discover like, oh, does it involve? Yeah, David Bahadi here is um, the man who wrote the anti-homosexuality bill. Um, he's quite proud of his affiliation uh, with the U.S. fellowship. Um, and I, it was pretty quickly after that, actually. So that, that alerted me to it. Um, and I, at the time I was like, oh, maybe this is part of this book I'm working on. I don't know. And then sort of scratching around. And then I think not too long after NPR or one of those shows, Voice of America, uh, a Voice of America Africa program had Bahati and I on together. Yes. Um, and I can't remember if it was on the air or if it was talking while we were waiting to be on the air and Bahati invited me, uh, to come see for myself. And um, he also established that one, this was really, I mean, I had come to understand this was actually, this wasn't a piece of crackpot legislation that was going nowhere. Um, this was a real danger. Um, his affiliations with the US fellowship were significant and real. Um, and then there was the fact of the invitation, which is the kind of sort of journalism I practice. I don't actually try and sort of, you know, I'm not Inspector Clouseau uh, or, 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 or James Bond, as I, the way I always say is I'm not James Bond, I'm more like Inspector Clouseau, sort of bumbling. I go and I knock on the door and I say, hi, I'm here, can I come in? <laughs> David Bahati invited me. Um, and uh, so I said, okay, uh, I'll go, I will go and see. Yes. Um, it's a sort of the stunning sort of overconfidence of so many in the Christian right. If you just see what we're doing, you'll understand. Right. You know, if you just see my plan to kill all the gay people, you will somehow be right. converted to it. You know, right? Um, they killed the gays that for, uh, too. Yeah, it, it was uh, it was amazing that he had that kind of uh, belief that uh, if if everybody could just see what he was doing. In the beginning, that's how he approached it. Yeah. Well, this is, of course. And the thing that was uh, uh, remarkable as well, and he, he was very clear about this in a couple of those documentaries you mentioned, uh, all my American friends want this too. Yeah. They just won't tell you. Yeah. They won't come out and say it, but they're, they're fine with this bill. Uh, now, that's not Which what is a sort of a, a very frightening thing. And, you know... We could never, as far as I know, I, we could never confirm the fullness of that statement, right? That's right. That's right. But what we could look at is someone like Senator Jim Inhofe, who for the longest time just refused to comment. Pretty easy, you know, that, that it's not going to, he's not, you would think he's not going to lose support if he just says, no, I don't support executing all gay people. He could not bring himself, he did eventually get around to that yes. brave statement. Um, <laughs> but but it took some time and really just sort of a lot of public pressure uh, to do it. So you sort of do right. wonder, um, is this Bahati's imagination? Clearly, a lot of Americans supported the spirit of the bill. They may not have supported, and we know some of them, uh, some like Bob Hunter, obviously did not. Right, um, right. Uh, uh, but where that line was is, is and, and remains, uh, a kind of a frightening thing remains. If anything, we'd say, given the sort of the current power structure, maybe we should be more frightened today than we were in two thousand nine. Well, things. Uh, I guess, I mean, that's jumping ahead a little bit in what I wanted to talk about. But yeah, things haven't changed. If anything, the, they're a bit more frightening for right. totalitarian kind of uh, approaches to uh, these questions. Uh, now you you went to Uganda. I, I forget you did take him up on that, right? I mean, yeah, you went, yeah. And uh, do you recall what do you recall about that uh, trip and meeting Bahati and uh, talking to him about this issue? You know, I, I say the first thing I sort of felt like when I got there was sort of kicking myself because I had written a family. Uh, largely from, there was some reporting. I had, you know, lived for a short time in one of the family's or, uh, organizations. I spent time with Senator Brownback, some other things. But I was kicking myself. Why didn't I go 
to these these satellite countries sooner mm. because whereas in the united states you're sort of always dealing with this sort of layers of secrecy and paranoia in uganda you just say uh, well now uh, david uh, how long have you been part of the uh, fellowship well let me tell you all about it they were so eager to boast of their affiliation with this american power and i was like yeah. why hadn't i done this and 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 that was that was sort of revelatory to me for understanding the nature of of the way the american centered power of the family worked in the way that the united states exports culture war um that what might be controversial here can be a sort of an an object of prestige in a country mm. that is in the shadow of this far more powerful much wealthier country and even as at the same time and, and you remember this with, with bahati the way he would also frame this and and this not just bahati but so many of these sort of anti-LGBTQ crusaders, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, as a form of resistance to a kind of neo-colonialism. That the new colonialism is that now, now the claim is that even as America is exporting this sort of anti-gay culture war, the claim of these folks is that they are resisting uh, the gay plague, the gay culture that is coming and, and to varying degrees, and that was fascinating too, you know, to hear people say, oh no, homosexuality never existed in Uganda. Yeah, um, right. And, and, you know, you only had to scratch a little bit, you know, to be well, one, you knew that homosexuality always existed in Uganda, but not only had it always existed in Uganda, it had not taken the same course that it had in the United States. You don't want to make the mistake of overstating and saying it was tolerated, um, or actually maybe tolerated is the right word, not approved of, but known about and tolerated. And there was a sort of a space for it. And the idea of political activism to oppose it was utterly alien. That's what, that's what came from America was the idea that this could be a political project. Mm -hmm. Um, and you see, you know, I, I always thought that Bahati, I, I think to this day, I think he's a pretty savvy politician. I thought there was something ugly in the way that, some American liberals wanted to frame this as, you know, they were playing into these sort of, you know, very old racist stereotypes of backwards Africa and so on. Mm -hmm. Bahati wasn't backwards at all. No. Bahati was a smart, savvy politician on the cutting edge of a, a kind of political weaponization of sexual orientation. He um, saw an issue and went right for it. Yeah. And he's yeah. he's a, a powerful politician today. Yeah, it really that's Uganda. that's a, a disturbing thing is it uh, you know on the one hand uh the bill was defeated, right? And this is I think of this all the time and there's not a lot of I don't even think in terms of victories and defeats in my writing. I just sort of say, well, I'm just uh, I'm going to try and account for things and, and describe them. But that felt like a victory. On the other hand, from Bahati's perspective, it worked pretty well. It was meant to catapult him to a much higher level, and it did. It did. Um, I mean, it almost makes you wonder, Warren, I don't know, maybe this is, you know, uh, did we defeat the bill at the expense of putting a, helping a ruthless politician ascend and, and, and create a new generation of, of, you know, autocratic politics? For Uganda, I don't want to. We gave well, him an international profile. He s certainly did, and and uh, now he would have even if had it had passed. I mean, it did pass, and the the court uh, there, yeah. you know, said it wasn't constitutional. But uh, if it had become part of law, he would have still. I mean, that may have may have still put him in the same place. For him, it was it was political, uh, and he may not. I don't know what his actual attitudes. Oh, I think he genuinely. I think the belief is real, but you know, you have any number of real beliefs. Which one are you going to act on? Right. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any certainty that he would have that this is the issue that he would have seized on. I think he sort of took an inventory of his own, from my point of view, bigotries and hatreds, and said, "Which is the one." This will work. But, yeah. 
Yeah. This, this is it. Okay. And he, he certainly was uh, correct. And uh, they had a plan and they executed the plan uh, rather well using the ministers. And, you know, the, the target and the outcome was very, you know, quite nefarious, but the strategy similar, use the ministers to get the votes. Wonder where where where's that uh, <laughs> happening? Where where do we see that? Use the ministers to get the votes. Hmm. You know you know what I would I would love to know, and Bahati actually wouldn't be very transparent about this. Is uh, what what is it called? Uh, it's been some years since I thought of this stuff. Now the Leadership Institute uh, hmm. is that uh, Morton Blackwell? Is that his name? I think um, I think that's right. Yeah, um, and that was sort of one of the places in the United States that the Bahati had sort of studied with. Okay. Um, and he was always cagey a little bit about his relationships with U.S. politicians, which did exist. Um, and, but he, on the one hand, didn't want to get people in trouble. I think on the other hand, he also wanted to intimate that perhaps he had greater access than he did. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but the Leadership Institute, which is sort of trained generations of right-wing politicians, because that idea of, you know, using homophobia, that's as true of the Christian right. Uh, as it is, as, as it is sort of uh, Bahati. Um, and I, boy, I always think back to uh, an interview I had with uh, Ted Haggard. Remember, he was the uh, head of the National mm -hmm. Association of right. Evangelicals um, and was leading a fight against same sex marriage, um, even as he was, as we later found out, secretly living a gay life, right. of which he claims now to have been cured. Um, uh, and he spoke so candidly. He said, oh, yeah, we know same-sex marriage is coming. We know we're gonna lose this. This is a great organizing principle. That, that's what it was to them. Um, it wasn't that they would frame it to the public as this is the battle, right? Um, but according to Ted Haggard, and I think also to Chuck Colson, the old Christian right leader, who was, would be very candid, like uh, using, we're gonna use these issues. The fight for them was really with secularism. Mm -hmm. They needed metaphors. So for them, and, and enemies, the gay man, singular as this archetype, the Muslim, singular, you know, uh, whoever it is. Um, and it, they can switch them out. Um, so I wonder how much of that uh, was a kind of sort of political technology that Bahati first encounters possibly at the Leadership Institute in the US. Certainly there's a model there and then recognizes, wait a minute, um, there's a huge infrastructure in Uganda that hadn't really been taken advantage of. The churches had not been politicized. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, sort of like there's a machine here mm -hmm. waiting to be turned on. Mm -hmm. Well, there was some spade work done. Scott Lively was, yeah. uh, they're uh, plowing the ground before uh, that bill came along. Now, not much before that. And Martin Sempa, yeah. uh, uh, my, my good buddy, uh, yeah. Martin. I forget, uh, did, you, did, did you talk to Sempa? Sempa would never talk to me. He would never talk yeah. uh, to me. He did uh, have some, he, I think it was, see, I'm the king of falsified news, I think is what he said about That's me. Scott Lively called me a snake which I have in my bio. I think that's actually something <laughs> very nice uh, that I like to include. Yeah. But, uh, you know, on the, on the, the Sempa, the Lively, those, they were, you yeah. know, they all became part of the cast of characters yeah. in this story that just built from 2009 on. And I, uh, as, as it grew, I, I sort of marveled at how large the story became. You know, you in the in the documentary, the Netflix documentary you mentioned Romania, and uh, was it just uh, recently Russia passed a, just, I think July second, right? Uh, I just believe two days or July. No, the the, the story was 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 dateline July second, so I think it might have been the first of July that they a, passed uh, a ban on same sex marriage. Ban, right? Yeah. And so. That's not a, of course, that's a ban on, on gay marriage. It's not, you know, capital punishment uh, for homosexuality. So, you know, a little different there. But the, the, the anti-gay bill became quite a, an international 
story. And I, I don't think I'll ever cover anything like that uh, again or be a part of anything like that. What do you think made, you know, that, that small country in Africa yeah. such a focus for... Which most Americans the, had never heard of before. Uh, yeah. And then the fellowship, many Americans, I had not become a bit aware of it that all of that and all those cast character characters what do you think caught the attention and the imagination of people that got them to really take sides on the issue and, and, and it really did and it's sort of an interesting because it's 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 generally hard to get americans to care about any other country um right you know and and things Every bit as horrific, for instance, have been happening in Chechnya, but that hasn't gotten anywhere near the visibility. There's a new documentary uh, by David France, and hopefully that'll get a lot of attention. But I don't think it's going to be, you know, sort of nightly news uh, the way Uganda actually became. And, right. and I have to say, I wasn't, I did not see that coming, partly because I've been trying to sort of raise the alarm about the fellowship for so long. And there would never be any interest. I mean, I think in C Street in the beginning, I, I talk about a producer who at one point I said, well, they said, you know, give us a case study, you know, give us examples of what they do overseas. And so I, uh, this was uh, earlier and I sort of said, I wanted to talk about uh, Somalia where they actually had a far more devastating effect than Uganda. I mean, how do you, how do you figure out who's accountable for the dead? But Senator Chuck Grassley, I have no hesitation in saying he has blood on his hands and arming up uh, that dictator and so on. But the producer said, I never forget this. She said, what's a Somalia? Um, you know, I think she might've had it confused with Samosa. She thought I was talking about like some kind of dumpling. Um, and, and so why Uganda? I mean, I think a couple things went into it. I think, I think there's, there's elements of the sort of the struggle for LGBTQ rights that were, converging right that that movement and that i think that's probably the number one thing we have to think about the activism that people have been doing for a long time um uh what had led to this point where there was a moment where people were ready for this great awareness i think for the media it did help these sex scandals that the fellowship was involved in right so that got news i mean when i wrote the book the family uh i I think you know this story. I remember NBC News first said, oh, this, this seems like a big story. And they did a segment on it and like, okay, we're going to follow up on it and it will just be along with the rest of the press, but we're in first, right? No one cared. It just was like dropped down a well um, until uh, the, you know, Mark Sanford, the then governor of South Carolina and Senator mm -hmm. John Ensign um, of Nevada and uh, Congressman Chip Pickering all had these sex scandals. And, you know, what's a Somalia? I don't know but a politician having sex with the wrong person. That's national news. Yeah, we got that. Uh, uh, or used to be anyways. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, um, and that made that visible and that got lots of attention because it played right into a kind of ready-made liberal narrative of hypocrisy. And so that, then you could say, well, what else is this group up to? Um, Uganda, and I think the fact I think also you really have to acknowledge uh, um, Terry Gross and uh, mm. Rachel Maddow, Terry Gross on NPR, right. and a producer actually at Terry Gross's show, Amy Sallet, who really focuses, paid attention to these issues. And they both invested their very significant media capital, you know, far, you know, by a power of 10,000 greater than mine, and saying at a time when no one else was paying attention to the story, we think this is a story. And that's worth paying attention to because there's stories out there for the press that like, oh, great, I've got the scoop. And then there's stories like something going on in Uganda where you know you're going to have to convince people this is a story. And you know not, ever, not all your colleagues in the press are going to come along. And they didn't, you know. Uh, Maddo in particular was sort of out there on her own wow. beating that drum for a while. She did. Um, uh, How many, and, you were on there several times. Oh yeah, she had, had me on there. Well, I'd already been on the show a few times. Um, and that's where I sort of where I think this, the fellowship connection, you know, so Maddo is maybe the convergence of someone who has been very alert to uh, LGBTQ activism for a long time. Um, and then had been alert 
to the fellowship. She'd had me on to talk about that. She was one of the very few people back when she had a radio show in Northampton, Massachusetts. She read the family and, and had me on. Mm. So she saw those two things converging. Um, uh, and even then, do you remember that uh, I think the State Department's, and this is the Obama State Department's, their early response was, I think I'm quoting, I might be paraphrasing, but I think it actually there was a, a statement that said, we don't have a dog in this fight. Um, and I that remember was, it was uh, kind of a tepid response, yeah. Yeah, like this is no big deal. And, what, and of course, that tune changed eventually as, as international media turned to it. And I think um, uh, it is a question though, and it's, it's, more, it's a question I think for long-term for activists and so on, because they were able, you had, you had such, Scott Lively for instance was, you know, you, there was video footage of him and he was such a ready-made villain. Um, and, oh no, uh, comparing gays to Nazis. That... Yeah, he made it simple. You know, you didn't have to say like, let me explain to you why this guy is wrong, you know? Um, uh, um, but all, all that said, I still think there's probably more to be learned from thinking about um, uh, how, how do you bring attention to, to a story like this? And how do you get Americans to understand? Because the reason they paid attention was not because they care about Uganda. They paid attention because of the American involvement. Um, and on the one hand, that's a form of narcissism. On the other hand, um, I think Americans are not aware of how much, we don't know about how big a shadow we cast over the world, right? So things that are going on in small countries far away have to do with, and, and this was the work that you did that was so important, had to do with the tithes you give in your church. You know, your church might be supporting Martin Sempa. So, you know, you're a truck driver or a school teacher and you go to church and maybe you give 10% of your modest salary and you feel good and you're supporting, you know, probably, you know, health clinics and spreading the gospel and then to find out, oh, and you're also supporting this guy, Martin Sempa, who is saying unquestionably the most hateful things and you pay, you help pay for that. Mm -hmm. That, that was, I mean, so that's maybe the question I would put back to you is because not only was this big as a big story, it was also big in evangel evangelicalism. Why did this, why did this case, you know, why, why, was, why was this, you know, why is this night different than all others? <laughs> <Jews said. laughs> um, uh, why did suddenly this break through? Yeah, I, I don't, uh, I don't uh, have a great answer to that, uh, really. I, I do know that the, uh, the it divided evangelicals uh, in in ways that uh, was there, it was productive. It was it would, in a way we got people to consider what was really important about the gospel. Is the gospel uh, a bunch of social issues that Christians must agree about, or is the gospel something much more spiritual? or religious, such as, you know, what is, what was the role of Jesus in history, and what's redemption about, and what's the mission of the church? Is it to save souls, or is it to change societies? And uh, this is where we ran into Seven Mountains teaching, I don't know if you recall any of that, oh, yeah. and, you know, trying to get Christians in all of these different places of of power so that you can reform society to make it look like uh, your doctrine and which, you know, that, that takes us back to some of the, the family's ideas of, of getting key men in certain places so that you can trickle down and influence things. Well, Christians had to, to really grapple with what's the, what's the extension of this idea. Do, do we really want some, um, some Christian, doctrine applied in our civil law and, yeah. and in uganda they were taking mosaic law their understanding of it and trying to apply it in their their civil structure uh, that was their justification simply used that justification and and Bahati and others they looked at the bible and said this is what the bible says to do 
And so this is what we're going to do in our civil law. And I think Christians who had, in this country, who had looked at uh, America as a Christian nation, they had to confront that. It, is, this, it, is this thing that we've said we wanted, now that, oh, we might see it realized? Right. Is that, the, yeah. is that the logical extension of our thinking? Right. Is that what could happen if we really are going to make civil law a reflection of Christian teaching? Now, if you don't believe that the Old Testament is applicable now, maybe everybody's safe. But what if people come into power that do believe that? And there are people within the broadest realm of Christian that Christendom that do believe that adulterers should be stoned. Uh, you know, daughters should be stoned and wayward children should be stoned and all of that. Well, what if they get into power? You know, do, do well, I, even there, though, I, I, like that's that? what I, I think about that, though, with in terms of the Old Testament versus New Testament. Um, uh, and, and it's true. I, I always I, I, I never I think I told you about this, an interview I did years ago with Sam Brownback, who's now Trump's ambassador for international religious freedom. Um, was before a senator and governor of Kansas um, uh, and a you know, member of the fellowship and so on. And, um, and was a fierce opponent of homosexuality when he was in, in, in the Senate. And I remember I, I had been interviewing him over a period of time and I really prepared for my interview about this. And I talked to, you know, um, I can't read scripture in the original language. So I talked to scholars who could and I was prepared for, you know, I was like, but aha, you know, you say it's this, he didn't know any of that. Um, he thought, what was his opposition from, to homosexuality based? For him, it was based in the New Testament. And I said, well, where, where in the New Testament? Said, well, I don't know. Jesus just sort of put it on my heart. Mm. And, you know, so, I mean, that's the sort of, I, I, I almost sort of wonder if that sort of like that fear of, of, of Mosaic law, right? Um, is a way of, of the threat is bigger than that. The threat is always the sort of the, the assumption that one's, the assumption that one's assumptions are in fact the embodiment of the gospel, that the things that you fear or hate and so on must be the things that Jesus fears mm -hmm. and hates. Um, and then that justification. Uh, you know, certainly I, you know, Mike Pence is not trying to apply Old Testament law. Um, no, and I think evangelicals uh, had to think that through. Uh, well, I do, I am morally opposed to homosexuality, but I don't think they should be killed. And that's what many evangelicals came away from. What do we really think then? What should the civil law say then about this issue? And I think that there were many uh, evangelicals who came away from the Uganda issue and, and thought, well, I, I, you know, I'm still not necessarily morally in favor or morally okay with any of that, but I don't really think that the state should have much to say about it. If that's, if that's kind of the logical conclusion to this over in Uganda, boy, I, I don't want anything like that to happen here. Yeah. And, and so now yeah, maybe, you know, maybe housing and employment, yeah, maybe we shouldn't you know, do anything about that. And so I think evangelicals had to decide, you know, uh, what, Oh, that, that once you do like a, 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 maybe a housing law, you are on the slope. If it's good enough well, for housing law, why, well, then why not go all the way? Yeah. I think that there were some evangelicals who stuck to their sort of anti-gay political agenda, no housing law, no, you know, we're not, we gay civil rights, no. But there were others who looked at the Uganda situation and saw, oh, that's harsh. That's too much. Well, we don't really want to get on that track. So let's, I think it's okay if gays have their civil rights. We don't have to, to stay, uh, to, we don't have to say we morally approve, but, you know, we don't want to go down the road of a Uganda. So if we take away civil rights, if we're really harsh, in the way that uh, the laws regard, you know, sexual minorities, uh, we might end up someplace like that. Well, we don't want to do that. And so I think that for evangelicals, 
it was a, a way to, to really think about what are the implications of our political stances uh, toward LGBT people. And well, I also wonder not just political stances, but rhetorical stances too, yeah. right? In the sense that, wait a minute, I, I never would have signed off for something like this, but now I realize that this, this rhetoric I'm using if you dehumanize someone else, right? In fact, if you keep speaking of the gay man as a singular villain, you know, school, te school teachers who are secretly gay and, you know, going to grab your kids, you're creating a demonic figure. That's right. And sooner or later, someone's going to act on that. And, you know, so it seemed like some people sort of really learned their lesson and changed and thought about that. Others, I mean, it seemed like Rick Warren kind of, Rick Warren, who, in fact, as we learned in Uganda, his anti-gay rhetoric, when certainly no one supposes that Rick Warren would su support a bill like that, no. but he had participated in that dehumanizing rhetoric, which led to it. In the aftermath, he seemed to kind of tiptoe away like a cat from spilt milk. He never said, boy, was I wrong. That I know well, he was one of the first to come out and say to the Ugandan pastors, you know, brothers, this is not the way. The, but he didn't say, brothers, this is not the way. And I take accountability. No. Because my I, teaching, my teaching was, was poor here. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm not going to put it all on you, you dumb Ugandans. How come you didn't understand me that when I said gays are terrible, I didn't mean kill them? Well, well heck, maybe I, you should have thought more about how you spoke first. I think that the, the response of the Ugandan pastors was pretty negative. I mean, they yeah. were whatever he said, they didn't like it. And uh, they basically rejected it. Well, he was blaming uh, them for a teaching that he had promulgated. And, and that, and they that I think taken further. Right. And I do think that uh, Rick Warren and, and other evangelicals had to think about a lot. And that's what Uganda did in many ways. Mm. And if, you know, if there is anything that could come from it, that would would be uh, a benefit. It is that people had to think about what's the impact of this this hateful rhetoric, and it isn't good. And it it may not lead to you know a capital punishment law here, but what does it lead to? You know, it it leads to uh, you know bullying. It leads to yeah. uh, harm to gays in other ways. And if we really believe that people are made in God's image, why would we, why would we do that? Why would we well, do I think that's where your work is really important in terms of especially getting uh, evangelical and, and, and other Christian religious sort of readers of your work to think in terms of cultural studies um, in a sense. And, and I think about this because especially in evangelicalism, there's long been this rhetoric of this is a cultural struggle or a cultural war, right? Mm -hmm. And yet a kind of naivete about how culture works um, that gave sort of a deniability. Well, I didn't say kill anybody. Yeah. Well, right. But if you have this rhetoric, you're going to have bullying. You know, uh, uh, young people are going to, they don't, they didn't say, let's see, they didn't say, pastor didn't say kill anybody, but they did say, homosexual is really bad and that kid is gay mm -hmm. so seems like fair game for bullying right and and the same in uganda i mean it's true that the bill wasn't ultimately successful the force of law was never put behind it but as in russia uh you know it's what i think you know and this is the bad news the good news is some many evangelicals had to reconsider. The, the bad news is other evangelicals realized the ones who were committed to this idea is we don't even have to pass the law. The threat of the law will, in effect, license a kind of low-level simmer of of kind of domestic terrorism. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we will never know in Uganda how many queer people were killed. Um, uh, in the documentary Call Me Kuchu, we learned about one, you know, prominent activist. Certainly some were. Um, and, and probably others that were never even registered as such, That's you know? Right. Um, uh, uh, maybe a, a wife somewhere is killed by her husband and it's just written off as domestic violence and we don't know it's because he finds out that she uh, is a lesbian. Um, uh, and all that kind of 
I think your work is in, in drawing the connections between bullying, you know, what happens maybe in your kid's school with what happens in the church with what happens internationally has been really vital uh, in, in terms of, of, of things. I mean, I, Warren, if, if you're really sort of thinking about this as sort of like a retrospective on your years of blogging, I have long been saying, uh, you know, you're a national hero. Um, and I really do actually think that. I actually like the, the national hero because we start with the First Amendment, right? And we go back before that. And you and I have talked about Roger Williams and the liberty of conscience. Oh, right. And the fact that you come to these positions not out of, uh, well, you are, you, you have become a gay rights activist, um, but you're the, an unlikely gay rights activist in, in so many ways, but out of a real conviction and liberty of conscience. I mean, that gives me hope for everybody, including myself, that I can always remember to, okay, I want, I want to respect the rights of everybody, um, not just those who share my beliefs uh, and so on. I appreciate that. Uh, and it seems like we, there's never been a time like now where those ideas are challenged. Uh, you know, that yeah. makes me think of um, the evangelical division that we talked about during the Uganda period is happening in a great in a great uh, similar way now with, you know, never Trump evangelicals and evangelicals who can't seem to see any wrong that Trump does. Now you have some evangelicals who hold their nose. They can see the wrong, but they're willing to they, go with it. Yeah. Yeah, they'll go with it. Um, and you, you wrote something recently uh, that um, I thought was uh, fascinating. Uh, from the point of view of uh, leadership uh, in the um, in the sense that uh, people go to Trump rallies and it's almost like a religious experience. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, was, I was wanting to have you talk a little bit about that, that do you interview, how many people did you interview or you interviewed some Trump? About, about a hundred this time, I would say that I spoke Okay, with. that's quite um, a few. I mean, and, and those are not, sit down formal interviews because sort of one of the distinctions oh, sure. I, I want to experience it as a, a religious uh revival so that means you know the kind of, I, I, it's immersion reporting i i get my ticket i wait in line for 10 hours and then stand in the arena for some more hours and you know i get the whole experience um as opposed to the press normally attending these events um uh, and i think this has actually been just devastating uh, for the political press, Trump puts them in a metal cage in the middle of the arena. Um, now, if you have your camera, you need a designated space for your camera, but then behind that are banks of print journalists who can't even see the stage. They're just sitting there behind the cameras at their computers in the metal cages. And Trump is like, this is great, middle of the arena and at every, every rally, he turns to them and says, look at those scum, the most dishonest people. Don't you hate those people? And the crowd turns and they scream. I mean, it is the loudest volume of the rally. It is a three-tiered uh, system. Uh, uh, number three is God. Religious freedom is in third place. That, that's good. Number two, though, is guns. Uh, guns matter more than God. Yes, and you see that in t-shirts all over. There's all kinds of guns and gods uh, uh, t-shirts. But number one is hating the press. Um, and uh, so I don't want to do that. I didn't, one, I didn't want to be screamed at. And uh, two, I, I didn't want to be a prop for Trump. Um, and, I, and I went. So I, I talked to about 100 people, I would say, at that one. And, uh, and I was following up because I'd done something similar in 2016. Um, so I had a point of comparison. And, and I, I keep thinking about this one because when you know, you're talking about the ways in which a lot of American evangelicals reconsidered the impact of their rhetoric and even, even you know, their commitment to putting into law some of these ideas. That's a story with a, a if not an ending, a a, a, a nice direction. Um, and yeah. you know, we can argue about uh, fast enough, not fast enough, or whatever. But I wonder how much of the the moment, you know, 
how much that Uganda moment also contributed to others sort of saying, you know what? Yeah, let's go for broke. Um, uh, and, and that divide doesn't feel like so much of a divide anymore. I think of someone like Russell Moore, um, uh, what's his position within the Southern Baptist Convention, and what certainly seemed to be one of those evangelicals who was sort of thinking more deeply about, mm -hmm. okay, what is the implication for law and so on. Mm -hmm. And the media still has him on as if he's representative. They say now for an evangelical voice who doubts Trump and like they're not saying, and who has no power and is utterly sidelined, <laughs> you know. Right. I mean, I, 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 look, I would love it if CNN had you on uh, and, and, and we could, and, or Fox News, better Voice yet. In the Warren is, yeah, yeah. Well, no, but we wouldn't tell them that. We would just sort of say, <laughs> Warren speaks for American evangelicals. And a lot of people yeah. would be out there and say, oh, is that who's going to believe? Okay, all right, sure. Okay. <laughs> who's that guy? <laughs> if, 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 he's, if he's my voice and he says so, I'll go along with it. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think the, What's interesting about the, 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 the religiosity of Trumpism is, is that switch from uh, the gay man as the enemy to the Muslim as the enemy. Um, immigrant. To the immigrant as the enemy. And that's where Trump rallies are at right now. And, you know, I mean, I have stood amongst pastors screaming like a mob. Um, with fury and anger, as Trump describes decapitations, disembowelments, carving out hearts, all the coverage, the coverage is so inadequate. And I think partly because the press doesn't really see his most violent rhetoric as political. They see it as just for show, when in fact it's the main event. He'll go on for 25 minutes um, describing horrible, violent things and people just, you know, frothing is not well, it's a little bit hyperbolic because they're not actually frothing, but it's close, you know, working that crowd up. Um, and I do wonder how much of this is, has been a, a, there was so much emphasis on the transactional relationship between the Christian right and Trump. Um, and I'm not one who thinks Trump is stupid. Uh, I, I think uh, he does understand the so-called art of the deal. He's just trying to do a different kind of deal. Um, it's not a fair deal. That's not his, his situation. Right. But I think he understands that the kind of deal he's interested in will be transformative. And it's not just that the Christian right, the Christian right has been transformed such that they have gone, followed into a real theology of vengeance and a, a grievance, which was always there, but of, of vengeance and a kind of titillated tiptoeing up toward violence, such that I still couldn't imagine an anti-homosexuality bill in the United States. But we both know there's any number of respectable evangelical leaders who will talk openly and seemingly gleefully about the prospect of civil war. Um, uh, so I don't know. I, I almost wonder if it's worse now. Well, you know, what <clears throat> I'm thinking as you're talking is that uh, the Uganda uh, situation got evangelicals to consider the role of the rhetoric and, and how that affected people here. I don't know that we've reached that moment uh, with the rhetoric toward immigrants. And maybe we have uh, racially. I mean, maybe just this last month. Uh, I don't know. Uh, time will tell. Yeah. I mean, as a as a culture, you can't deny, you know, a month of demonstrations. Something's happening, and yeah. uh, I, I mean, I hope that's good. We had a in Grove City, Pennsylvania, we had about three hundred people come out for a Black Lives Matter yeah. uh, march, uh, which is I've I've been here twenty five years. I've never seen anything like that. So something might be happening there, and I'm very hopeful, uh, of course, that that will come into the church. It, yeah, that's true. That's true. I, I was seeing it pessimistically, but at the same time, I, I guess I would argue with you and say that I don't think there's been a failure to consider the, the impact of rhetoric when it comes to immigrants. Uh, I think the church has embraced, I mean, 
I think the very, you know, the, the kids in cages, as it's called. I remember actually after the rally I went to in Hershey, Pennsylvania, this was originally going to be the end of the story. And then coronavirus came in. So that felt like we really had to address that. Um, I, the next day after the Hershey rally, I'm sitting in a Starbucks, just uh, getting some coffee before I get on the road. And at the next table are three teenagers and they just seem like real nice kids and they're talking, but it turns out they'd been to the Trump rally. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I got to talking to them and they were all part of a church and they called it a church on fire for Trump and they were having a Wednesday night meeting that night. And so they invited me. So I decided to stay and go to this Trump church and um, uh, not a big church, just a small, you know, medium evangelical church. You say um, Hershey is where this? It was, the, the church was outside of Hershey in a smaller town. I can't remember the name of, okay. um, but yeah, that, that area. Yeah. Alabama um, in the middle. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, and, uh, but the church was run by an immigrant. Um, where was she from? Uh, was she Guyanese? I think she was Guyanese. Well, they, they believed in male headship. So there was a man, uh, her husband was the pastor, but there was no question who was running that show. Um, you know, and for the interview, we go into his office. He sits over in a chair on the side. She takes his desk and mm. she preaches. And it was an absolutely violent rhetoric. And she, I said, well, what about kids in cages? Doesn't that trouble you? And she's like, no. No, I can't. She had a she had an argument about how Jesus would have done this. Um, uh, so that wasn't a failure to. Con I mean, she she had embraced the full Trump okay. program. Um, and I think a lot of pastors, I think certainly, um, you know, those that we see, uh, Franklin, Franklin Graham and Robert Jeffries mm -hmm. and so on, are have embraced that rhetoric of and Trump put it the way Trump put it in Tulsa. He said, our people. Their people, I mean, first of all, this, this idea, our people, their people, their right? People, right? Their people are violent. Our people are not, unless they need to be. And if that day comes, it will be a terrible day for the other side. I think of this in terms of Stonewall Jackson, who, whose monument was just taken down in Richmond. And the way years ago, I remember sort of seeing, being stunned by the reverence for Stonewall Jackson, even in evangelical circles that, were not besotted with the Confederacy, you know, in all these homeschooling textbooks, because he was this guy who didn't want to fight, didn't want to fight, didn't want to fight, then it's time to fight. And he switches and he would go praying into battle and he fought total war and no quarter. Um, it's Tom Cotton saying no quarter for protesters. We don't want to hurt you. But if we do, we're going to destroy you, you know. Um, that seems new to me, actually, Warren. I, I mean, you're, while your immersion in evangelical life is actually an evangelical life and longer, I don't, I can't, certainly when I, that was not part of the fellowship's rhetoric. And so maybe I was just missing it, but I don't think that was ever really part of. No, this seems new to me. This yeah. does, and it's it is it's uh, uh, it is frightening. Uh, it's I, it, I mean I do harken back to the late '60s. I you know it, it has that feeling sometimes as I watch the news, uh, but uh, trying to find the uh, the good guys among the Christians is, it's hard. I mean, the, because the rhetoric is coming, that kind of rhetoric is coming from those who are church leaders or, yeah. you know, are called church leaders. And um, it, it's, it, 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 that does seem different and it is disheartening. Yeah, so I don't think it's a time for you to retire from blogging, I'm afraid. I'm afraid we must press you into further duty. Work. Well, all right. I'll stay on for a year or so more. If, if you insist, uh, that, that's fine. <laughs>